Hello, everyone. One second. <laughs> okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the People's Forum. My name is Kate. I'm the editorial coordinator for 1804 Books, the bookstore you passed up there in the front. We are a movement incubator for working class and international communities. We offer political education classes, art workshops. We've been known to host a punk rock concert or two, all of that stuff. You can check out our offerings on our website or all of our social media. Um, but we seek to be a space for um, working class communities all over the world. So we are very excited to host Roberto Lovato, author of Unforgetting, a memoir of family, migration, gangs, and revolution in the Americas tourist space. Roberto will be signing books after the talk, so those of you who are here tonight can stick around a bit to get a copy through our new bookstore, 1804 Books. I would also like to introduce Alejandro Varela, who will be introducing Roberto, and will be in conversation with him about his book, Memory, the Relationship Between the Poetic and the Political, and many more things, I'm sure. Alejandro studied public health in graduate school at the University of Washington, and his work has appeared in The Point magazine, Boston Review, and Harper's Magazine, among other outlets. His first novel, The Town of Babylon, will be available in March, and his short story collection, The People Who Report More Stress, will be released in the spring of 2023, both published by our friends at Astra House. Thank you, Alejandro and Roberto, and everyone here for joining us today in person or online. Let's give our speakers a very warm welcome. Take it away, Alejandro. Can you hear me? So uh, this is my first indoor event since the pandemic started, and I have two kids at home, so I'm keeping the mask on. If you can't hear me, uh, just signal to me, and, I'll, and if I'm speaking too fast, also signal to me. We good? All right. So uh, good evening, buenas tardes. Thank you, Kate, for the introduction and for hosting us here at the People's Forum. I'm glad to be able to have this conversation with Roberto. But first, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge that we are in the ancestral homeland of the Lenape, that New York City is home to the largest urban native population in the United States, and that a conversation about the repatriation of indigenous lands is both feasible and long overdue. All right, now onto the matter at hand. Roberto Lovato is a journalist, teacher, and the author of Unforgetting, published by HarperCollins, a memoir picked by the New York Times as an editor's choice which the paper also hailed as groundbreaking. An award-winning author, Lovato is the recipient of a reporting grant from the Pulitzer Center. His essays and reports from around the world have appeared in numerous publications, including the New York Times, Guernica, the Boston Globe, Foreign Policy, The Guardian, Los Angeles Times, Der Spiegel, La Opinion, and other national and international publications. In the face of the tragedy and crisis of the war raging in El Salvador, Roberto made the difficult decision to join the FMLN guerrillas fighting the U.S.-backed fascist military dictatorship responsible for killing 85% of the almost 80,000 men, women, and children in El Salvador during the war. This is according to the United Nations Truth Commission report. In addition to the chronicling and social movements and the stories of organizations as a journalist, Roberto is also a longtime strategist who has participated in some of these very movements and organizations. He led the Central American Resource Center, Carecen, in the fight against California's Proposition 187, which was the de facto beginning of the immigration wars of the United States. All right, hold on, I give up. It's very hot in there, okay. All right, I tried. Uh, Roberto also helped to conceive of the Drop the I Word campaign, the I word is shorthand for illegal alien, illegal immigrant, and other harmful terms used to dehumanize. He, su he successfully co-organized co to remove these racist terms from the Associated Press style book and newspapers throughout the country. He is the co-founder and first coordinator of the Central American Studies program at California State University at Northridge. He led the team of faculty and students that established the first Central American Studies minor of any university in the United States which has since become its own department. He is the co-founder of Presente.org, the country's largest online Latinx organization, best known for the successful campaign to remove extremist television host and Trump advisor Lou Dobbs from CNN. And most recently, Roberto joined authors Miriam Gurba and David Bowles in co-founding Dignidad Literaria, 
the movement advocating for equity and literary justice for more than 60 million Latinx persons left off of bookshelves in the United States and out of the national dialogue. Thanks for that. Roberto works out of the Writer's Grotto in San Francisco, his birthplace. Please join me in welcoming Roberto Lovato. Thank you, Alejandro, and thank you all for joining me. I've never seen so many Salvadorans in New York City. Uh, it's a fucking miracle. Um, where did y'all come from? Uh, but no, I'm, I'm happy to be here among friends and people I hope uh, get something out of what we have to say. And I just want to say Alejandro is one of those Salvadorans who's here, and he's an author. He's the author of a soon-to-be-published book called The Town of Babylon, a novel about the essential nature of community and how to maintain your health, because he's a health practitioner by by uh, training and practice. And, you know, it's an intimate portrait of queer, racial, and class identity. So please give him an applause for stepping up. <laughs> oh, and it's published by Astra House Press, uh, whose editor will be here later, uh, we expect. Um, so just before we jump into the questions here, I just wanted to give a little background about how this came together. Uh, Danny Vasquez, who is my editor and a good friend of um, Roberto's, asked me to participate. And I, to be honest, I said, I don't know. I mean, I mean, as you heard Kate say, and R Roberto just repeated, I have a fiction book coming out next year, and that's it. And he is a story journalist 30 years into his career. Uh, he is a revolutionary truth teller, a poet, a warrior, and a survivor, as we will see in this conversation. And uh, I'm like, are you sure? And so we had a talk and he said to me, Alejandro, you are the authority on what you know and what you've lived, but you're also the authority on your own ignorance. So only you know what you don't know. And I, uh, I really appreciated that. So I'm just gonna begin real quick by saying that, yes, I am the son of immigrants, one of whom is from El Salvador, and my early perceptions of the country were filtered through her. Uh, a parent who, has, who never spoke directly about the political landscape or anything, I had, I would hear stories of una tía guerrillera, but very little. Um, I gleaned from some stories that my mother left because of the stress and violence that she had witnessed and experienced, but even that we never talked about. So to me, El Salvador was Semita, Pupusas, Isalco, and I mean the restaurants in Queens, not the volcano, uh, the Oliver Stone movie, and then a few random memories that I had uh, from one-week trips that I took as a kid. And it wasn't later until later that I became acquainted with the country's history and my country's complicity in its oppression. And it wasn't until I read Unforgetting that I saw all of the pieces come together, not only the struggles of a people uh, and a place, but of families and individuals, and also the beauty and the fighting spirit of El Salvador and its people here and there the telling of which is the product of Roberto's process of unforgetting. So tonight we're gonna to talk about the book, but we're also gonna talk about the role of memory and art in political action, which I think about a fair bit. So I write fiction, but I tend to write as if I were having a very real conversation uh, with the reader. And specifically, I imagine I'm having, I'm trying to persuade a liberal friend that a radical approach to remedying injustice isn't only humane and logical, but often efficient and cost-effective. And so, yeah, like I'll write a short story about queer sex in downtown Manhattan. I've written a few of those. But what I want the reader to walk away with is an awareness that, for example, the greater the gap between the rich and the poor, the worse the health of a society is overall. And when I write about a Latinx family's suburban odyssey, I want the reader to put down the book and contemplate how our country can pump $1.5 trillion into Wall Street after two weeks of a pandemic, but then deny a national dialogue about reparations for the descendants of enslaved peoples after 400 years, no? So sure, I want to entertain, I think like most um, artists, most writers, but I also want to create visions of the possible and to instigate, which uh, aren't mutually exclusive. And so if, um, I'm very interested in this conversation with Roberto tonight. And so let's get going. Uh, Roberto, tell us about the origins of Unforgetting, and uh, what did you set out to accomplish when you conceived of it, and what, if anything, do you want your readers to walk away with? Uh, that I used to have hair, first of all. That's one of my main things I want people to remember. 
No siempre ha sido pelón. Um, uh, the book comes about first out of love for my people. You know, we we love ourselves, and you look in the English languages, there's nothing that says we love ourselves. Pretty much, I would send students at Cal State Northridge when we created Central American Studies to go out and find articles about Salvadorans, for example, and inevitably, what would come up? Gangs, says my friend Carolina, former gang member herself, sorry. Um, yeah, gangs. Um, during the war, it was refugees. And now we've graduated to these two-dimensional images of pain and sound bites of suffering that you see in the stories of child separation and um, uh, caging children, right, that began with Barack Obama in 2014. I have the receipts. I don't need to explain it because I don't take this to be a liberal crowd except for maybe David Galarza over there. Um, so the, the origins really are to just tell our story and, and uh, I don't want to say humanized because we've never, we to ourselves are, have been human, but we've been dehumanized by society. And for example, the, the phrase that is most commonly associated with Salvadoreños in the English language is terror is the given of the place, which was from who? Anybody know? Yes, Joan Didion in your Portugal. So Joan Didion spent all of two weeks in El Salvador during the war and um, went to uh, spend a lot of time in the air conditioning offices of the embassy, accompanying them or, you know, in their offices. So she came up with this deep, profound statement about El Salvador and Salvador. Terror is the given of the place. And I myself, in my college days was like, fuck, Joan Didion, that's deep. <laughs> you know, like, whoa. And I wanted to fit my reality, like, wow, you know, it is. Terror really is the given of the place. And then, you know, decades later, as when I became a writer, because as you hear from the bio, I spent some time doing some other things before I became a writer. And uh, I was like, hey, hold on, man. She spent fucking two weeks in the embassy. What the fuck do you know about terror? You know, I spent, you know, 50, now 57 years of my life connecting to this tiny country of titanic sorrows. And uh, it ain't just terror, it's a lot more. So I, I wrote the book because I wanted to say to myself, to my family, and to the world, yes, terror is, the, is a given of the place, but so love is also a given of the place and of the people. So I don't know, I put a lot of love into this thing. I don't know if it comes out, but si le puse mucho amor, como decimos. I mean, I guess the other reason I wrote the book was to explore the work and the effects of forgetting on society. On, you know, uh, to, to explore amnesia in individuals, amnesia in families, amnesia in nations. You don't get a fascist state. You don't get the inklings of fascism without amnesia. I knew this from the Salvadoreño experience of war against a fascist military dictatorship in the way that identities were formed because of forgetting. So I thought, I want to fight that, so we're going to unforget. Um, and along the process, I got to excavate parts of myself that I had forgotten. Some, in some ways, some of the best parts of myself um, that, that, that I had to be quiet about whether in family or in, or in political circles. And I guess the last reason I wrote the book was to create a blueprint to drop as much knowledge about how to navigate the vagaries of perpetual crisis that we now live in and that will be the society that your children, families, and loved ones will grow up in. So, we're gonna, so I think Salvadoreños and Salvadoreñas have something to offer the world in terms of how to navigate perpetual crisis. And so I, I wrote a book that aspires to do that. So I think now you, we're going to play the video. Oh, yeah, you'll see the, basically the, the one, the two minute elevator pitch. My name is Roberto Lovato, 
journalist and author of Unforgetting, a recorded memoir excavating the real American dirt beneath headlines about MS-13, caged Central American children, and the humanitarian crisis of immigration. Headlines in which the voices of Central Americans in the United States have been silenced and forgotten. Unforgetting is also about an underworld journey, my journey across the cities, forests, and deserts of the 2,500-mile chain of forgotten, dead, and devalued life that begins in El Salvador, where I visit mass graves, morgues, and hideouts where gangs and governments have killed, dismembered, and disappeared their victims for decades. Along the way, I encounter gang leaders, death squad operatives, and guerrilleras who reveal their sometimes startling truths. Unforgetting also chronicles my inward journey to find the stories of revolutionary hope, poetic imagination, and the tenderness that survives the terror. Unforgetting also leads me to Los Angeles, the birthplace of the gangs that would later be exploited for political gain. Eventually, I return to my birthplace, San Francisco's Mission District, to the stories of my immigrant family, including those of my father, Ramon, who bore the astonishing secret that would alter my life. I'd like to invite you on this journey towards forgotten love and healing that we must all take if we are to face the crises of our time. Please join me in the adventure of Unforgetting. Un aplauso because the author of this video is in the house, Marcos Levy, my friend. His services, his services are available, he's pricey, but you know, we might be able to get you a discount. Talk to him after the event. Oh, by the way, did you see that picture of uh, the, that ID um, with, with hair? So the, the, the ID is fake. It's what the Comandos Urbanos gave me to operate, but the hair was real. Okay, I'm going to emphasize that all night. All right, so uh, would be remiss if we didn't talk about the structure of the book. I mean, the book is many things. It's a memoir, it's a political, it's political nonfiction. It's also sort of a thriller. The structure of the book is a braided narrative. The, you expertly move between the present and at least two other eras. Why did you choose this structure? Excellent question. Um, one reason was, you know, it was an exploration of the nature of memory, right? Memoir has to do with memory one of the defining qualities of it. It's not an autobiography or a biography which just tells the whole story of somebody's life, but actually selecting pieces of a life, fragments of a life that come together to tell a larger story. So that was what I was attempting to do in exploring, you know, the way that our lives are fragmented by modernity and all this other stuff you students learn in university, I imagine. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I thought, you know, how do I get into the fact that, a lot, you know, we are all living, I hate to use the term because it's been so cheapened by so many, the word trauma, right? It's so cheap and I, I hate to use it, but it's a, it's a good shortcut. And um, yeah, I wanted to get into the way that the extreme violence that we witnessed in El Salvador as a community and, you know, in our own families, right? Because I talk about the violence that I had to deal with through my dad um, you know, it fragments us. It fragments our sense of ourselves. It disconnects us from our bodies. It disconnects us from the past. And it makes us uh, happy and willing warriors for the state oftentimes. Or it makes you a good gang member, right? So, um, you know, I, I also did it that way because I, I have like three layers in the book, three different time periods. The present, which is kind of the journalist search for why El Salvador, when I'm there in 2015, becomes the most violent country on earth in terms of homicide statistics. Um, so there's a journey to search there one layer. Then at another level, there's a father and son story where I kind of, the arc of it is like I love pop, because every kid, you know, when you're born, you love your parents. And then I grow in adolescence, I start learning about pop and some of his underworld dealings and you know, start loving and hating pop. And then love, hate, and rebel against pop and the state of El Salvador in the United States. And then come back and love pop on my own terms again. So I want, that, that, that's the second layer. The third layer is 
pop story, which has, he has this really astonishing secret that I don't want to, kind of if it was a movie, I don't want to spoil it. But my dad has this really heavy back end story. And I tell the story of how I found the back end story, but also just tell the back end story. So kind of connecting all those different fragments to reflect the workings of memory in our lives, it felt like going through different, you know, jumping across time and space, which is what our memory does. Your memory doesn't work linearly, you know, your memory's not white, right? So, you know, it's your your memory's spiral, your memory's colorful, your memory's Puerto Rican, Dominican, Salvadoran, it's, it is different. So I also, you know, I also wanted to look at, you know, the issues of not just trauma, but of the joy and the, the, the beauty and the, the, the power of the, of the beautiful and the sublime in our lives, because that's really, I realized in the course of writing it, damn, how the hell do I not have a bullet in my fucking head, right? And I realized, and my brother knows this better than anybody, like, it was the power of the beautiful and the sublime, the people, the love, the, 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 the arts, the music. There's a lot of music in the book. And so um, that, that seemed like the best structure, a braided narrative to go across space and time to do that with. You just use the word underworld to describe. Underworld is also a bit of a theme in the book. Do mm. you want to explore that a bit? Yeah. Um, if you look at the book, but you look at my life, I, didn't, I came to realize through the writing of the book that I've inhabited a lot of different underworlds. I was born into the home of Maria Elena and Ramon Lovato, two immigrants. There's a whole immigrant underworld, for example, you know, whether it's undocumented or or, or documented. Um, then you have my dad's underworld, because it's a father-son story. And my dad's underworld was my dad used to be a basically a kingpin inside of San Francisco's Mission District. Out of, he used to run out his operations out of Hunt's Donuts. And he used to send up to like 19 boxes of contrabando to El Salvador, and he used to run guns, right? Not to, for the Frente, as I romantically would have loved if my dad was a gun runner for the Frente, but he was just making a profit to sell guns to people down south, you know, to support his family. You know, and I, I kind of realized where all these sociologists talk about the construction of crime and criminal and criminality. Um, so there's that underworld. Then there's the underworld of the gangs, the dominant trope and metaphor of Salvadoran identity. So I, rather than go around it, I wanted to go straight into it. And I went and I met with the very top level leaders of, MS, of the MS-13 and 18th Street, bring the reader into that world, and guess what I find? I find human beings. Human beings who are killers, because I'm not gonna joke about that, they're killers. It's people that I've met, some, many of them, not all of them. And, uh, but even the killer has a history that's been forgotten. Right, and then you mean you want to talk about trauma? If you want to talk about a killer gang member, you're talking about a walking, talking, shooting, unresolved trauma. So, um, so there's that underworld. There's the underworld of the FMLN, right? The guerrillas and that whole part of my life that, outside of close friends, I was never talk about publicly. And uh, I could go on and on about how much it took for me to actually come out about this part of my life that for me is one of the better parts of me that actually did think about the other and to sacrifice for the other. You know, but I was, I was not alone and I did it in, in conjunction with people all around me in solidarity and in organization. And you know, there's the underworld of your family history and the secrets that inhabit our family, our families and the, the secrets of states, those are underworlds. And so underworlds are Oftentimes, if you look at moments of crisis, they kind of spring up at different moments in, in history where the surface of society doesn't really have much to offer us in terms of life, life preserving, life manifesting energy. And so people tend to go into the underworld when uh, there's all this superficiality and lies in the surface. And so I kind of started studying mythology and whatnot to get into this. And, and I, just, I just realized I was an underworld creature. Uh, <clears throat> the title of the book, Unforgetting, is, all, is the dominant theme. Mm -hmm. you know? 
on forgetting El Salvador's history and your family's history, in particular your father's, which you've alluded to. But along the way, uh, part of the remembering uh, includes peeling away the white supremacy of Americanness. You talk about how the U.S. culture, how U.S. culture robbed you of yourself and your ties to your family's culture, the American machete of erasure, if you will. Can you speak to that, to the internal work of undoing, of undoing assimilation, and maybe even tie it to the external work? For example, Dignidad Literaria. How difficult has it been for you to speak truth within the confines of the current literary establishment? Uh, that one's not hard at all, because fuck all them. <laughs> um, you know, but uh, I, hope, I hope it's okay in the people's form to use expletives. So if not, I'm sorry. Uh, so the idea of I'm forgetting, I actually came up with the title here out of a bunch of different titles. You know how it is. You've gone through this where you go through back and forth with friends and people. And um, I landed on it up in upstate at a retreat with uh, my friend Andrea, who's actually coming out with a book uh, soon, and, 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 and some other people at the um, Logan Center for Nonfiction, which if you're a nonfiction writer, it's a great fellowship to have. They put you up. They feed you and you get fellowship with cool people, smart people. So um, Andrea was like, man, that's the one. And I explained to her where I got it, which was from when I was a right-wing Christian. I used to be a right-wing Christian. A mili I learned to be a militant in the church, right? There's power in the blood of Christ. You know, I was like, you know, I was a quote-unquote at-risk kid, and the evangelical ministries would go and identify us and recruit us. I had a friend, my friend Hiram Vasquez, who doesn't talk to me anymore. I think he's a Trump supporter. Um, Hiram got born again, and then he planted the seed along with my mom, who guilt-tripped me into reading all of the Bible when I was a kid. And so, um, uh, you know, I, you know in, in, in I, became, I became a part of the church. I wanted to be a pastor. My superhero was uh, Jimmy Swaggart neo-fascist biblical guy and uh you know in my biblical studies I, I i found this this concept of aletheia greek concept which is the means unforgetting it means uh it comes from the greek idea that when you die you go into the underworld and you cross the river lethe which is the river of forgetting so that before you go into Elysium or to Hades, you have to forget who you are, which is, I think, is what society asks of us to serve the state. And so I'm like, well, fuck that. Um, you know, how do I combat this in writing? So um, I love this concept as a Christian. And then I s left the church, and in my college studies in German philosophy, I found out about Hannah Arendt using this term, um, aletheia, to talk about um, the need to unforget is a way to fight fascism in the theater of memory and culture, right? Because I, I really do passionately believe we cannot move forward without looking backward and being very rooted. I mean, our memory is part of our imagination, right? The, if you, you know, think about the radical imaginary, the radical imagination. Well, Part of it is creating and you know, using language, using colors. A lot of the creativity that's come into this center. But a lot of it is also rooted in the past and in our memories, how we see ourselves. So like, I think unforgetting is critical at this stage of our game because especially you young people, you have to have a sense of your own history if you're going to fight forward to defend something, mm. right? So um, the state knows this, and I think we need to remember it. Um, so that's where the the title come from and uh, you know I that's kind of my jam right now you know really still I really I really think that and I never thought I would like first write a memoir second of all I never I geek out on memory you know but I, I, I really do believe now that um, I can see very clearly and I try to express it in the book to show the very deadly workings of bad memory or no memory Right, whether it's in gangs, whether it's in the state recruiting people for the military or the police or death squads, right? I found a pattern of amnesia and forgetting in all these different folks that I, that I met. So 
um, dignidad literaria comes about because, uh, well, first of all, you know, we created dignidad literaria before that awful book that uh, American Dirt came out. Um, uh, you know, we created it to, to jam up the AWP, the Association of Writing Programs, which is one of the biggest literary forums in the United States. And my friend Barbara Reno Gonzalez and Virginia Grace and I kind of came up with it. And then Miriam Gerber, this fabulous writer and really, you know, brilliant, brilliant person, writes this scathing essay called, I don't quote me, but something like, um, you're no Steinbeck pendeja. <laughs> right? And I was like, fuck, I like that sensibility. Let's, let's, so I reached out to her and we started talking and, you know, we started, you know, saying, you know, I said, look, let's take this energy you put on this white woman and put it on the industry. You know, I had already organized plenty prior to last year. Wait, can we check in with the audience? Are, is everyone here familiar with American Dirt and what that conversation <laughs> was about? Yeah? You maybe want to... American Dirt says, book that was hailed by everybody from Oprah Winfrey, um, Sandra Cisneros, and others as this... Sandra Cisneros said this, she said, American Dirt is not just the great novel of America, it's the great novel of Las Americas, right? Now, basically, so step aside, Gabo, step aside, Gabriela Mistral, fuck you all, you guys, here is Janine Cummins. She speaks for you all. She is the definer, the literary for us. That's how they sold it to us, so I was like, all right, le vamos a dar un talegazo a esa piñata, boom. And sure enough, the piñata gave up candy. It's not the be all do all, it's not about representation. In fact, that campaign was primarily about us. We ourselves rising up to the occasion of our dignity in the literary community and saying, no, this awful book that is chock full of racism, uh, terrible language, and I mean, this is basically a story of this mother and child, Mexican mother and child that ride the bestia, the train that goes from Mexico, the southern Mexico to the northern Mexico that I've been on. And the only Mexicans on the train are um, the people who operate it and some of the crooks that want to pick off the Central American migrants. So she took this Central American story and she made it a, a middle-class mother who basically tells her kid, hey, listen, you know, we got to go on the bestia. As if they didn't have the choice to say, do we ride your dad's your your dad your 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 uncle's four by four Lexus to to the border. Do we catch a bus or do we just fly into San Diego and overstay our visa? Those are all choices to a middle and upper class person. But instead, they said, "No, mommy, I want to go on the bestia with the Central." America. They didn't say that, but that's what they wanted us to believe. Which is how preposterous the premise of the book is. So it's like, all right, well, this is an opportunity to educate people about. Um, kind of the Latinx condition in U.S. literature, which is dismal. I don't need, I think, to tell anybody here how dismal it is, right? Some of you work in publishing, I think, if I recognize you and you know. Was it difficult for you to get Unforgetting published? Uh, no, because I strategized my ass for six months. I have consiglieries, literary <laughs> consiglieries, some of whom are in the house, like Andy Shaw and I don't know if Danny's here yet. There he is, Danny, Carolina. There's people here. They've been my high counsel. They're, they, they hold a high position in the acknowledgments, and along with other people. And you know, I'm a strategist by trade, and I kind of like mapped out the terrain for about six months, just trying to figure out how am I going to get this to be the first Central American nonfiction book written by one of us about us, non published by a major publisher, because. I'm too old to do the independent thing at this stage. It's a whole other animal. And I assess that I'll go with a big publisher. They have a distribution network. And so I wrote the book before, and then I titillated them with things that would appear to be the kinds of s exotic things that they want to see, gangs and revolutionaries. But those things weren't foreign to me, and I had already written the book, so I wasn't exoticizing. And so then I navigated the space and got the deal on my terms. I had a great editor, a great agent, uh, Julia Carden, Aaron Wicks, and they respected my, my words and my, 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 my vision for it. 
And I, but I spent six months, and I would strongly advise anybody to spend as much that kind of time into, if you're gonna write, spend that kind of time trying to figure out how you are positioned on the map of, on the racist, classist, homophobic map of US publishing. Um, you answered the next question, so I'm gonna skip that one. But um, uh, there's a lot of beauty in the book and a lot of love, as you've said. There's also a lot of violence, and you talk about the violence you've experienced, that is, state-sanctioned, interpersonal, intrapersonal. How was it for you to revisit these events in the writing of the book? Did it reactivate the past for you? Was it cathartic, both? Mm. Um, it was all of the above and more. But I, I did the wisest thing, and I would actually advise those of you that are gonna write or create something, whether it's film or something, that's really personally heavy to do what I did, which was and the wisest thing I've ever done as a writer, which was retain a therapist before I embarked on the journey. Because I realized, I said, damn, I'm gonna open up Pops violence, I'm gonna open up the Pandora's box of the war, I'm gonna open up the box of my own history of violence in different ways, and um, I better get some help and map this out before I start on the journey. And as the gods of health and decent writing, because I don't want to say if it's any good, but I feel good about what I wrote, but the gods shined favorably on me and gave me a therapist who happened to be a son of a Holocaust survivor and who was also a former hippie and who was part of a clandestine network that prescribed the most powerful medicines for dealing with this thing called trauma, which is None of my friends better ask, you all know. Psychedelics, <laughs> right? I'm a Californian, I'm a real bona fide Californian, okay? And I've been doing the medicines for 40 years, right? And mostly on an experimental basis, not just for kind of, you know, my first time was in a, in a low rider on Mission Street. I dropped mescaline, we just tripped out. I wanted to lick the paint on these cars and I was really loving and friendly with everybody even though, you know, it's the mission in the 80s. But subsequently, I, I started really being, so when he said, that, when my therapist offered that in 2015, I'm like, hell yeah, let's do it. And so we mapped out the emotional terrain that we were going to be navigating. And piece by piece, because if I was to take on the whole, the, the whole thing of the book, my head would blow up like that dude in Scanners. I know I'm dating myself. Some of y'all remember Scanners, where that dude's head blows up. So, um, you know, I, uh, I, 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 I had some help. I wouldn't recommend, I don't recommend to people to write for catharsis. I'm not into that. I think your story is your story. It has its own organic sensibility. Uh, if it's, it did turn out to be cathartic for me, but I didn't write it to, for catharsis. I wrote it because it's the story and I love the story. Um, and. I mean, really, though, it is kind of a, I mean, if you look at writing, it is a, like an act of what Buddhists call mindfulness. You know, because you're intensely focused on these sentences, you're intensely focused on these moments, on these people in your life, and, um, you know, and I, yeah, do LSD if you're gonna write a book, too, man. I mean, like, really, I, I, I'm, I've written, I'm writing an article on this uh, about the, um, the, the, what I call the gentrification of consciousness that's happening right now with psychedelics coming up. You know, anyway, that's another story. I don't want to get into that. I'm sorry, I deviated. No, no worries. Uh, I think now you wanted to do the reading. Oh, okay, okay. All right, so as is traditional with these things, you, you read. So I, I wanted to share a part. I was going to share a part. I want to share a part that shows the relationship, I don't know if I succeed, but I'll try. The relation, I think it's important for us right now at a moment like this one that is so like epically crisis ridden, right? So I think we need to kind of, sh as writers, I mean, at least I, that's what I kind of like to get is to, 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 to show the relationship between the epic and the intimate. I feel like we're in an epic moment and we don't even know it. We're not taught that this is an epic moment. We're taught that Colin Powell was a hero, you know? Even though he 
was party to the mass murder of thousands in Central America, for example, that I have the receipts on. And we talked about that on Democracy Now!, by the way, there's the video. Um, so, uh, you know, so the, so, you know, so, and you, know, you also want to show, like, I'm, I'm, my mission is also to show Salvadorans as regular people, even when you're in the war, right? And we spend a lot of time in war, 12 years as a people, and it affected, it affects us to this day, right? All the remnants of war. And so, um, so, you know, I thought, how do I bring people to understand kind of Salvadorans, but also the, the, those of us on the Salvadoran left who during the, at the height of the war were one of every three people. One of every three people, according to the UCA, Universidad Centroamericana, the Catholic University, documented that we were, one of every three Salvadorans was organized against the state. So I wanted to bring a little bit of that spirit to the English language and to the United States so you could see, just like these people rocked my world. So I, the person that most rocked my world at that period was a person named G. I met her when I was in my 20s. I fell in love with her. She was a guerrilla leader and then a uh, diplomat with the Frente. And uh, being a 20-something dumbass that I was, I didn't know what to do when love came my way. And so um, I'm, you know, I'm in love with her, but I'm getting ready to go to El Salvador to join the struggle. And uh, she's all into opera. And we're in San Francisco. And I haven't told her yet that I'm leaving. So this is kind of where that begins. And she remember, she's a diplomat with the Frente, so her, she's on these lists of people the government uh, would kill on sight if they found them in El Salvador. So she's talking to me about opera and her love of Carmina Burana, which I thought was weird. How's this revolutionary woman into this bourgeois music? Boy, she turned my head around, took me for a ride. I'm still not off, and I like opera now. So, yes, yeah, she said, the government radio played Carmina Burana to mock us. So it became the music we used to remember our martyrs, our martyrs. Musica de combate. Yes, you have to avoid romanticismo, base romanticism, which is dangerous. But we must, by all means possible, have the espíritu romántico, including through opera. How else can we do such intrepid things without being romanticos in this sense? At Berkeley, Professor June Jordan not only wrote unapologetically political poetry, but she also taught us the work of Claribel Alegría, Roque Dalton, and other Salvadoran poet warriors who provided generations the spiritual sustenance needed to face the apocalyptic violence there. June Jordan showed us that our love of people and our political beliefs were inseparable. The personal was, in fact, the political, a truth G so beautifully embodied. After a minute or two, my mind returned from its lofty romantic musing. There waiting for me back on the ground was G, and the hard truth that I was leaving for El Salvador soon and still couldn't, hadn't told her. As much as I wanted to spend more time with you, I burned to go back to El Salvador. Yes, experiences in Chalatenango had moved me, but also my involvement with G and the Salvadoran revolutionaries called out to me in operatic ways to take on the ongoing struggle against fascism continuing the work of the poet warriors and revolutionaries I'd read about at Berkeley. Anti-fascists like Orwell, the Lincoln Brigades, Paul Robeson, Hemingway, and the warrior poets like Muro Rukeyser and Joconda Veli. The opportunity to be part of such a movement made me feel alive. Look, G, I began, I think the world of you. In the little time since we met, we've become pretty great uh, friends. Uh-huh. Yeah, you're a great person, a person I have a lot of respect for and I'm learning a lot from. Yes, but I made a decision. I'm going to El Salvador and not sure when I'm coming back. I see. So you don't have any idea when you're coming back, when you'll be back? No, I don't. She paused, then she started crying. After a couple of minutes of tears, the resolute G returned. I won't forget you, Tito. That's what my friends call me, including some people here. She said, please don't forget me. Fuck, she's not making this easy by making it so easy. Unsure what to do, I remained silent and simply said to myself, adios G. But when I got home, I cried. So then cut to San Salvador. I'm 
working with the Comandos Urbanos, the urban commandos, which is a very different kind of a guerrilla operation from the you know, traditional image you have of the guerrillero in the mountains. So, you know, I'm in my apartment, you know, kind of safe house, where very few people know I am, except people in our inner circles. And I'm pondering, what the fuck am I doing here? Why did I do this? And uh, in the weeks that followed, as my guerrillero work continued, my mind raced with questions, fears, and excitement. Even as I tried to keep all the rules and responsibilities of my role straight, these included altering my routines, coding my messages, not talking with anyone about my business, and doing things in the least expected way, such as taking different routes to destinations. Sometimes Chamba, my, my responsable, the guy who I coordinated with in the Frente, and I would meet at El Camino Real, one of the swankiest hotels in the country, dressed as businessmen. I always wore Pierre, a Pierre Cardin suit, a black market suit I commandeered from the ones Pop had left at my Tia Esperanzas. We'd also met other commando units at restaurants, other five-star hotels, the downtown McDonald, and other public locations along with clandestine safe houses. There was a constant and urgent need for equipment. And I was, oh shit. Okay, well, I'll just, this wasn't the part I was gonna read, but there was a constant and urgent need for equipment and I was consumed thinking about how I could secure the needed material. materiel. Uh, Later on, I got a shock as I was laying in my apartment in San Salvador, sipping some cola champagne, one of the piss gold soft drinks every Latin American country has. I was reflecting on how much things had changed for me since leaving San Francisco the year before, when the phone rang, an unusual occurrence given that the place, I lived in a place few except the compas knew about. Bueno, may I help you? Hola, Beto. The silky sweet voice sounded familiar, but before my heart leaped, I paused. Gee? I asked, yes, where are you? San Salvador, what? Yes, I'm here. You're here? I said, my voice reaching higher octaves of disbelief. Yes. I remained silent for a moment, stunned at the fact that this woman who pl publicly represented the FMLN had somehow managed to get into the country. The Salvadoran government had her and other publicly identified members of the FMLN on the list of people to detain on site at any airport or border crossing. G could be killed if they caught her here. What are you doing here, I asked. I'm here on some important business and need to speak with you, she said in her trademark, no-nonsense tone. Sure, when and where do you want to meet? Let's meet where the light shines, she said, which was code for Las Antorchas, an open-air restaurant frequented by the compas. The restaurant had torches placed all around the edges. I wanted to know about this special mission almost as much as I simply wanted to see her. I showered, put on some nice clothes, and armed myself with my secret weapon, Jovan Muscoil, my preferred cologne. I showed up a little late to a, find a smiling G already there. A white-haired guitarist was playing Ella, a lovely bolero from mom and pop's era, in front of a couple at a nearby table. G was looking ever the summer beauty in a black flower dress that hung on her tight body wonderfully. The Salvadoran sun made her round face look especially radiant. Being G, she rocketed us through the niceties and started in with the reason she'd come. The smell of flat iron beef grilling beneath the thatched palm roof and the fancy blue tropical drinks with the wooden umbrellas in them gave the restaurant on busy Boulevard de los Héroes a suave, intimate beach vibe made stronger by all the antorchas. So T, she started, I'm here with some important news. How'd you get into the country? The compañeros got me some glasses, a wig, and a fake passport, and I came in through the Guatemala border, she said, en voz bajita. Wow, that's pretty gutsy. Noting the need to talk about the, her need to talk about the mission, I asked, so what brings you here? Well, to be honest, you left me in limbo, T. Huh? In limbo? What do you mean? What the fuck is she bringing this up for? Before you left, she said, when we were getting to know each other in San Francisco, you said we were more than friends. You gave me chocolates, you wrote poetry, and gave me other signs that led me to believe that what you said was true. Uh, well, yeah, that's kind of true, I guess, but yet, on the other hand, you left things ambiguous, she interjected, like you weren't sure that 
what we were after such beautiful moments we spent together. Okay, yes, I said, still waiting for the larger mission to reveal itself. You know me, Veto. You know I like to be Clara, said G, sounded like the focused diplomat and explosives expert she was. Yes, you do. You know I can't stand ambiguity. No, you can't. So I would just tell you, Tito, I'm in love with you and need to know how you feel about me. I've been living with this ambiguity since last year and want you to be clear with me. I can't keep living like this. Uh-oh. That was the fucking, that was, that was what she fucking came for? Me? Fuck. Subversive in war turned out to be, also means subversive in love. My immediate thought, G came to undermine my game plan of macking on lots of women in wartime in Salvador. Yeah, because the, you know, calzones flew all different directions during the war. But I also recognized our shared desire. I kept looking at her in disbelief, and the rush of memories came to me, walking near my old church, talking about opera, feeling like she actually liked me for me, despite feeling like a fucked up kid in the mission. Fuck. So I did the obvious thing any red-blooded revolucionario salvadoreño, Salvadoran macho would do in such a potentially explosive situation. Uh, excuse me for a second, I have to go to the bathroom. I'll be right back. Uh, okay, G said in a tone that said, what the fuck? On the way to the bathroom, I walked up to the old guitarist dude playing music in the restaurant and whispered in his ear. Then I went to the bathroom, combed my curly hair, and washed my face before I came out blasting like I was Michael Corleone entering gangster life at the Bronx restaurant. I strolled back to the table. So you want an answer? I asked, standing before her with the guitars behind me. Here's your answer. The guitar started playing Sabor a Mi. I'd learned the lyrics of the classic bolero turned low rider oldie about the lover's taste when Pop used to play it for mom. Now I put his Orphic powers to use myself. I started serenading G. The song ended, I smiled and said, there's your answer. She smiled back and got up to put her face close to mine. We paused to inhale each other's breaths and then our lips finally touched. We decided to go to a cheap motel used by sex workers working near Tia Esperanza's house on Cinco November Street. Early in the morning before dawn, as we floated out of the motel high on new love, we were greeted by the sight of soldiers who were about a block and a half away and coming our way. We turned and walked quickly in the opposite direction, hoping that a taxi or some vehicle might come in our direction. But there were no cars in sight. An eternity passed before we saw the lights of a vehicle approaching, surely our last opportunity to escape torture and likely death. So I won't tell you if we live or die, but uh, <laughs> you, could, you can read the book. <laughs> Somebody just asked me, hey man, is that true? It's like a movie. I said, yeah, G is a living, breathing human being who I'm accountable to in the truth. So like, she doesn't want me to use her name, but if all the compañeras and compañeros in the frente and in our movement know who G was and they know me. So like, you know, I was, I had to, wake up, but people, I have, I've had people ask me, that's not real, is it? Did you really live through that? I said, yes. Um, I was gonna ask you more about the poet warrior tradition, mm -hmm. but you somehow answered most of what I was gonna ask you, it, but it's fine. Uh, there's a slideshow that's going to even answer that a bit more, I think. You want to get to that? All right, all right. Yeah, this is stuff about memory because I didn't want to just focus on the book, you know? And Okay, so um, any tradition, as anybody knows, is a, is a construct. There's no such thing as a real, quote-unquote, tradition. They're all cultural creations, traditions are. They're periodized, they're... You know, so, so, you know, I, I, you know, and so I'm like, man, you know, I identify with what I call the poet warrior tradition in America Latina, right? Where you have all these folks who were like fighters, but also being kick-ass poets, literally kick-ass and kick-ass literarily, which I think what we need to aspire to right now. You know, I think we need to be powerful in action, but also powerful in our words and how we write and how we walk. So... Um, this is a brief, oh, hold on, I gotta, all right, so what am I doing wrong? Okay, there we go. So you wanna know what my travels around this big, beautiful earth have taught me? 
a hint has to do with this picture. Anybody? All right. It taught me that the border is a machete of memory designed to both erase history and divide families and entire peoples. That, that satellite picture is of uh, Del Rio. Anybody remember Del Rio in the news? Recently? What was it? Well, it was where this happened, where um, these fascist border patrol folks went after, um, I mean, basically the border patrol is a media operation. I'm not sure I should, sometimes I'm like, well, should I share that image? And I'm like, yeah, it's, it's, it's theirs, people know it. But the point is, like, for me, is the borders are illusory and political theater designed to reinforce illusory identities that create and defend another illusion, national security. And I learned that the borders are machete of memory, a dangerous illusion that maims and kills child and mother innocence, regardless of how, how, who is president in any country, whether it's El Salvador, Central America, or Mexico, or the United States, whoever's president, our people are still dying being murdered by the states and their, their actions and their inaction. And I learned that even the most challenged and humble among us can and must do whatever we can to destroy that dangerous illusion of the borders in our minds, right? Because the border is primarily a, it's, it's theater, it's, it's not primarily physical, it's primarily cultural. And it shapes identities, I mean like, starting with the identity of the nation state that at this point in history is truly illusory. I mean, it's always been illusory, but it's especially illusory now. So in the face of this, we need a poetic sense to create a line break, a pause in the false stories we're fed, right? A line break in any poem is like where you break the line and then you go into the next one. And you can do things when you break the line that kind of stir, can stir the reader's mind. And that's the beauty of poetry, right? It forces you to stop and look at the page and sit with whatever's there. So my line break came in this scene that's in the book from Chalatenango where um, these, uh, you can guess what happened here. It was uh, a bombing in, in this, t this, this little, this hamlet called Corral de Piedra and where there were about 16 children and some adults and I won't go into the, I don't want to trigger anybody, but needless to say this, uh, you know, this happened a lot in the war zones where your families that are in the urban areas didn't really know about it. Because the people, la gente que más vivió la guerra fue la del campo, right? Cause, and, and that was forgotten. So I was working with the uh, non-governmental organization and the, wow, look at the states, they're outside not liking my message. So if only, if only we live. So this is where my, this was a kind of a breaking point for me, a line break, where I decided, you know, I don't think, you know, I was still kind of, a, to be honest, kind of a liberal progressive at that point. And then uh, it was at that point that uh, I decided to, to join the Frente. And, um, you know, in the scene that I shared with you, is I, I, I went back to get my stuff and to come back to El Salvador because I had made the decision. And so during you know, the war, I found out about this, these folks who were writing poetry in clandestine safe houses in La Montaña. They were dancing the Credence Clearwater Revival in Santana. Like, and, and, the, and a great secret, by the way, just as an aside, is why do Salvadoran campesino guerrillas like Credence Clearwater Revival? Okay, any of you all that are PhDs or students can go investigate that. And, I will greatly value your, your, your findings because it's an important question. So, um, so I mean, the, the greatest of Salvadoran poet warriors was Roque, the best known and arguably the greatest is Roque Dalton, you know, who said, la poesía es como el pan, es de todos. Poetry is like bread, it belongs to everyone. Very simple but beautiful and true, you know, and that's what makes poetry, it's truth and beauty. So, I mean, the example of Roque and his son is a friend of mine and uh, who was in the same part of the FMLN that I was in, the FPL, Fuerzas Populares de Liberación, and he actually granted 
a great Salvadoran poet, Javier Zamora, and I the rights to translate Roque's poetry for the book. But it wasn't just after they killed, Roque was killed by a guy named Joaquin Villalobos, who was the top commander for one of the five organizations, the FMLN, the Ejército Revolucionario del Pueblo, the ERP. And he hasn't been brought to justice. And so after they killed Roque, there's a splinter group of folks that split off from the ERP to form the Resistencia Nacional. And these were people that belonged. And do you know who started the Resistencia Nacional? Poets. Poets founded a revolutionary organization. You know, they were all organized in this thing called La Masacuata. And I'll give a commercial for my, one of my closest friends, Joaquin Chavez's book, uh, Poets and Prophets uh, of, the Re of the Rebellion, or the Poets and Prophets of the Resistance. Uh, yeah, Joaquin, Joaquin Chavez, Joaquin Mauricio. And so, you know, you had like Lil Milagro and all these dudes forming this revolutionary organization that was doing, you know, Commando Urbano work, work in the mountains, and they were also hardcore poets. So um, this was like super inspiring me because poetry in El Salvador during the war was a way to communicate news when you have a military dictatorship that controls all the means of communication, right? Oh, that was just another old poster, pretty cool old poster of, um, from La Masacuata. And so, I mean, I also locate poet warriorship, you know, here in the United States. You don't have to just be a guerrilla fighter. You can be a fighter for justice and be a poet warrior, in my opinion. And so you have people like my former teacher, uh, June Jordan at Berkeley, who basically used what we call educación popular, popular education, Paulo Freire's techniques, to teach literacy and, and poetry. You learn poetry, you learn how to write, you become a poet, now you go teach in the community. That's the spirit I think we need right now, and so I refer a lot to this in the book. So what is poet warriorship? Very quickly, in my opinion, this is a work in progress. It uh, challenges the illusory border wall between literature and action, poetry and politics that keep these two as separate pursuits. Anybody familiar with this tradition? It's the one that prevails here in the United States. You know, it's the one that, for example, has every single Pulitzer, Ma most major prize winners not saying a fucking single thing about Barack Obama the entire eight years. Except yes, we can. Right? I, I'm the kind of guy I geek out on this kind of stuff. I go, where are they politically? Like, uh, uh, yeah, I don't want I won't name names. You want to talk to me? Give me a drink. We'll name names. Um, so, poor warriorship also prioritizes the visionary where Main Street thought prioritizes the decadent illusion of a long existing order. Again, there's that idea of tradition and order. This will not change. That's what the state wants you to believe. And the idea that it can't be changed. So, um, you know, I mean, really, if you're going to fight, you gotta be visionary and connect to vision that propels you under whatever circumstances. I think those are, given the, the crisis-ridden world that we're in, the perpetual, the perpetual crisis that is our lives now, we're going to need powerful visions to sustain the struggle. I think the failings of the left right now show that. And so you got people like Hambo who incited us to disorganize the census because we're in this epic moment of our census being organized by the state and its allied interests, right? They're literally I mean, it's just the technology is astonishing, I think. And we, as poets and as political people, need to disorganize our own senses and those, and encourage it among others, I think. And so Hambo was really, he, he, you know, they teach Hambo in MFA programs, but what they don't tell you is that he came up with this. Do you know when? Right after the Paris Commune. Carolina Gonzalez, ABD, PhD in comp lit, knows this. But very few people in MFA programs know this. They're just taught this, but they don't tell me, yeah. He learned about it when people's senses were being organized by the terror of the bombing during, you know, the Paris Commune. And so then there's another example. I love to use these maps. Just, you know, I, I ask students at colleges, is this map wrong? And you know what most students will say? Yes, it's wrong. The map is wrong. 
well, no, it's not actually. It's an ac as accurate a representation as anything of. Uh, so obviously, the poor warrior has to be anti-capitalist. You, you know, you're not going to be kind of, you know, arm in arm with Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates to fight the state. You know, it's just not going to happen. So, and the poor warriorship connected, you know, between bold acts of imagination and physical acts of great power and imagination, like these dreamers who were part of kind of the left flank of the dreamer movement, right? Because the dreamer movement was divided at the time. There were dreamers who were serious leftists, ideologically like clear, and then there was these dreamer groups that were created with the help of big foundations here in New York to represent, I mean like my friend Juan Carlos here knows that, that history and, uh, of you know, kind of these astroturf kind of immigrant rights organizations and whatnot, but don't let me get on that uh, thing right now. So yeah, that's, that's that. <laughs> I think now we're gonna move over to, uh, move on to a Q&A. Uh-oh. So Kate, Kate is gonna come around. So if anyone has a question, signal to Kate. Question, thought. I don't buy it. Uh, hey, how you doing, uh, Nico? Um, so first I want to sort of contextualize, thank you by the way for the talk and uh, for your book and 30 years worth of work. Um, I think I want to contextualize the question in more for you to like share with us any self-reflection when it comes to core to the book, right, is thinking about counter narratives, thinking about complicating uh, sort of now decades worth of information and also lack thereof, right? There aren't many films or shows about... About Sal Salvadoreños? Or? Yeah, about Salvadoreños. Okay. Um, but a lot of us also hold with us, right, the things we learn, um, the things, the ideas that are often harmful to ourselves as a community too, right? And so can you tell us about a moment where you had to sort of confront um, ideas maybe around like homophobia, right, within mm -hmm. ourselves, or even how we thought and remembered El Salvador. Like, I'm part of a generation that's like, you know, questioning pride and the nation state and nationalism. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I, I'd really appreciate if you could reflect on a moment and how you confronted that. Like, was it through community? Was it through therapy? Was it, th like, how was it that you confronted those things? Well, that's a great question. Um, there's a whole subtext in the book about nation states and I hate nation states. Not just the United States, but El Salvador, the nation state of El Salvador. There's a, actually, you look at the opening quote. Let me read it real quick as a way to get into this. Um, so it's a quote by a guy named Ursh Renan, one of the preeminent theorists of nation states back when, in the late 19th century. Forgetting, I would even say, historical error is an essential factor in the creation of a nation. Historical inquiry, in effect, throws light on the violent acts that have taken place at the origin of every political formation, even those that have been the most benevolent in their consequences. Unity is always brutally established. So I try to go in from, you know, I have, as you read in the book, I developed in my youth this theory called the shit travels downward theory of human, of Salvadoran identity, right? Because, you know, it goes from the state to our parents to the dog and then eventually it ends up on you like it ended up on me and my family. When my dad beat my ass and verbally humiliated me, made me the rebel that I became, right? Um, and so, you know, you read like R.D. Lang, great, brilliant psychologist of the 60s who talked about you know, your first entry point for encountering the state are in fact your parents. And you can see that whether it's in homophobia, all the, 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 the homophobia of our parents, the, homo, the, the racism of our parents, right? Encountering, you know, negro, that phrase and the way it's used. Or, and then you kind of like as a kid, you just kind of assimilate it and you don't interrogate it until you realize. And, you become afraid for it. I grew up near the projects and I was afraid. I grew up 
eventually to the point where I was afraid to bring my black friends home to my house, to our apartment, because of my dad and the stuff he would say. So uh, I think it's, uh, yeah, it, it starts in the family, and I, it's an important theater of struggle is the family itself. I'm, and I'm, you know, yeah, do I want to encourage young Salvadorans to go and kind of engage their folks? Yeah, engage family members. I, I, I feel the same way about nation state identity, too. I share that with you. Thank you for the question. Oh, another Salvadoran. These Salvadorans are not this guy. How, how can you tell? La pupusa la tenés enfrente aquí, man. It's also right here on my socks. Oh my God. <laughs> Um, anyway, my name is Carlos Guadron, and um, thank you, uh, Roberto, for coming out to New York and uh, talking to us. Um, so you you talk um, you quoted uh, Joan Didion in a book, um, you know, um, and I was wondering if you were concerned after writing the book, even though it ends on an up note, if people were going to walk away with the same feeling that El Salvador is a place of terror, fear, silence. Um, if yeah, if that was a concern for you. Uh, yeah, the, qu the way I read your question, good question, is like, am I going to reinforce the violent image that's already there? Well, if you notice in the book, I don't really go into a lot of scenes where, there's a few scenes where I feel like, you know, I'm taking you on this journey that I've been on as a memoirist. So you got to feel my gut, you got to feel my heart, you got to feel my mind. So it, I select moments where, boom. Right, um, but yeah, I was very cognizant. Like, there's a scene with a guy who is at the very top of the gang chain of both gangs, Santiago. Santiago was a, I call him a gang diplomat because he was a part of this political commission, basically, that the MS-13 and 18th Street gang established. And he was charged with negotiating with the government. Now, the person advising them, I can't prove this, but the person advising them was a guy I knew was an ex-comandante that I knew. He's now in jail. But I, I think I saw his hand in this because the way that the gang started forming their Comisión Política just rang so familiar to I know, ese, ese, ese puta anda conspirando con, con la pandilla. And so like, um, uh, so like, Santiago's a brilliant guy, and he has this, when I meet with him in this clandestine place, um, and he like hunted like any of the leaders is, and he's one of the, was one of the few that was free. He had this book on the table, The Hunger Games. And I could, you know, eventually I figured out like, and I'm kind of scared because this dude's scary and, you know, these guys could take you out and they don't like what, they, what, what, what you say. He had this book, and he and it was like those. And I compared it to these white ladies in in uh, Berkeley, who put you know those art books on the coffee table. To, hey, let's talk about Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo, you know, or something like that. And um, you know, he wants to, we start talking books, and Santiago ends up starting to talk about. I kid you not, Homer, Galliano, uh, Garcia Marquez. The guy was supremely well read. And articulate, and he he even quoted the ¿Cómo se le llama la Real Academia? Yeah, the, the dictionary, the the, the Bible. ¿Cómo es? Gracias, Real Academia Española. He quotes this thing like to talk about what the state is doing with media. I'm like, fuck, that's brilliant. No es por nada that he was up where he was. So I do this, and he's a father of two, and he says he would never let his kids get in a gang. And he loves his kids, and he's a killer. And that's kind of the contradiction I want the reader to come back with. I don't want him to, and I figure, instead of running away from it, I want to go into it. You know, into the heart of darkness, quote unquote, which is the frame that Joan Didion and most white writers have used to talk about our people. Go into the heart of darkness to find the heart in the darkness to show the heart, because you're not going to deny the darkness, not just of El Salvador, but of the United States. And I think the book, at least I try to show the, um, how violent the United States has been, how complicit it's been in the mass murder of our people. 
And that's why, to this day, I don't call myself American. Like this whole chapter, when I saw that stuff in Chalatenango, I stopped calling myself American forever. Going back to kind of the nation state, I'm like, fuck that, I don't wanna be that anymore. And I created my own term, American, with an accent on the E. And if you ever wanna like destroy the border, just put an accent on the E and start calling yourself American. And you destroy the border instantly. That's kind of the point. I mean, I really do believe in, again, I'm sorry if you New Yorkers are offended by my sensibilities, but I really do believe in consciousness. You know, I don't know if my friend Andy's still got some California in him, comrade, but really, consciousness, good question. <laughs> I'm embarrassing my friends for showing up. Don't be shy. You have a question, ask him. Sorry, I'm gonna have to hog the mic a little bit. Salvador is stepping up for a bro. Thank you, man. <laughs> um, another question is, um, have there been any consequences to revealing your family history, like psychological, legal, <laughs> emotional? Ooh. Anybody planning on writing a memoir here? Okay, one. Anybody else? Anybody planning to write a memoir? And also, it's on Facebook right now, right? Okay. So, um, yeah, what I did, you know, I used my strategy. I'm like, okay, I got to map the terrain. So, what's the emotional terrain I'm going to traverse in outing Pop, in not just in his glorious Orphic powers? My dad's a super poetic dude, really funny. You know, but I'm also going to out him for being violent and have, for having humiliated me. Las cosas que no se hablan. Right, I wanted to model behavior for the Salvadorans who know exactly what I'm talking about. You know, we have to not just confront the state. We got to confront the expression of the state. There are families. That's kind of the big point of, that's backed up by the shit travels downward theory of identity. So like, um, so I mapped out the terrain and I preemptively struck with the people I thought would have issues with me exposing my dad in his glory and in his not so glorious sides. And it worked. I, I'm an organizer. Just be an organizer. Align people, you know, Marxist, Leninist, or whatever your preferred drug of choice. You know, approach people and organize and align them to get the desired outcome. And for me, the desired outcome was peace in the family and to have them embrace the story. And all my family embraces the story because they see that I was true, even my father. Because my father, when I, when I told him what I was gonna do, mire, iba a ser justo. You're gonna be just. Si, papa, voy a ser justo. And I told him also I was gonna talk about his ancestors who were, some of whom were murderous. Iba a ser justo con ellos. Si, papa, voy a ser justo con ellos. Which means I was gonna bring them to narrative justice by exposing their fascistic murderous tendencies. That, because my dad was like a, uh, he grew up in a shanty town that made Steinbeck's Grapes of Wrath look like a pizza party, right? So like, super poverty. I mean, you're talking about super poor in the middle of the Great Depression. And his father was this big cafetalero, a coffee baron, who I found out was, a, was part of the mass murder of 1932 in La Matanza. So he was happy that I also brought some justice to them. And so, yeah, my family, it's a risk, but we have to take risks if we're going to bring about social familial change. I think we individual change as well. If you're going to take a psychological approach, you've got to risk looking at yourself in all your, your, your own glory and your own ingloriousness. I think we're going to leave it there so that uh, we have enough time to sign books. You have yeah. More time. Can I just say thank you to the People's Forum? <laughs> Kate especially has been awesome and like super professional and you know it's really cool to be super professional and super political and I love that. So um, thank you, thank you People's Forum and also to Danny Vasquez who kind of like I was coming to New York and I wasn't going to do an event about two weeks, two, two and a half weeks ago and Danny uh, 
persuaded me and he persuaded me that this was the place to do it and I and that you were the person to moderate and thank you. Yeah, then he persuaded me. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So we're all carrying Danny's water in some yeah, way yeah, yeah, in the yeah. back. <laughs> so but, but thank you all and thank you all for showing up. Thank you, Roberto. <laughs>